Horror. A genre of the dramatic arts that seeks to elicit a response from within an array of dark emotions. Fear. Anxiety. Disgust. Paranoia. Terror. Stress. Gallows humor. Etc. I have my cat here who might interrupt from time to time. <laughs> if you've watched my show, you know there's a cat that's going to interrupt, so don't worry about it. I have no animals about me that I know of, but we'll find out. Oh, no. You never know. You never know. Excellent. Well, if uh, Brian and Gam can join, I guess they'll join us in progress. Um, so thank you guys for like jumping on today. I know it took a little bit of organizing and a little bit of back and forth, but I'm glad it all worked out. Uh, this hasn't really ever, I think, been done for, at least for the YouTube audience. It just The idea here is just a conversation between people working in the genre, people who are passionate about what they do. This isn't an interview by a wild stretch, and I think that's the strength of the concept. Um, uh, I'm not going to have everyone introduce themselves. I think everyone is known. And you've all been on the channel before, so it's like, you know, they can watch the previous videos if they really want to know who you are. And there's Mr. Brian. Hey, Brian. Hey. Hello. Good morning. One Brian leaves, one enters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got two in the same room. That's perfectly true. Is this uh, Thunder, <laughs> Thunderdome? Or, uh... <laughs> in fact, yeah. have we ever seen them together? That's the question. Uh-oh. Hmm. Mm. That's a good point. Good point. I, I kind of like now desperately want Brian Hodges conquering conquering worms and uh, Brian Keane's prototype. <laughs> Speaking anyway. of, I don't know if you can see in the background, but he just he just skulked back up into his office there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It needs to this be is sort of like a Hitchcock shot, isn't it? We're going to see this figure behind Mary approaching my <laughs> <laughs> sort of weapon. And we're all going to shout, Mary, for God's sake, look behind <laughs> turn around, turn around. Turn around. Around. She'll be muted. So she will, she'll think we're just waving at her, you know, being, being friendly. I know, and I would too. I'd be like, hi, guys. <laughs> the host, part two. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> The keening. <laughs> the keening. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's just start off with something that um, I, I think really will just lead us through the entire conversation, which is can everyone just give me like, a, do you have a favorite work in the horror genre, whether it be a novel or short story or one of each or something that's close to your heart? Not your own work, though. No cheating. Mm. Hmm. Yes, the white people, Arthur Macken, I'll, I'll start, um, which I think is possibly the, the greatest tale of supernatural horror in the field of my experience. I mean, you know, candidates include uh, The Willows, The Outer and Backward, and The Color Out of Space, although that's technically more, you know, cosmic horror rather than supernatural. But I think the white people does so many things so subtly. Um, it's it's never into, I mean it's 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 one of those stories that, that says nothing but but tells you everything if you like it's a it's a it's a classic instance of not the unreliable narrator but the unaware narrator where you know we know dreadful things are happening and yet the narrator is telling us these things um, in such a matter of fact way oh well on the whole there's certainly a, a poetic quality as well to it um, that, that that there's this extraordinary tension um, on an intellectual and Dare I say, because Mackin, obviously, in terms of this, almost a sort of spiritual level as well. Now, okay, it, it does have a framing device, which is two, two chaps discussing the occult, specifically discussing notions of sin. But once you get to the, the green book, which, you know, forms the most of that narrative, um, I think we are, are in a completely different world. And I don't know of any other supernatural horror story that, some, that sort of conveys a sense of, of the mythic and the occult. Um, as, as powerfully as that does. It's kind of interesting that 
Macken intended this as being simply a part of a novel, and his wife died, which apparently was you know, all he had done of that section of the novel, and ultimately he, he rescued it by, you know, put bookending it with, with a discussion. Um, what that novel would have been like, we shall never know, but I, I'm certainly, you know, more than grateful for what we've got. That's a good one. I, I like that one. I like... Uh, Awesome choice. White people. I I would say, and, and for, I guess for a number of reasons, probably uh, The Haunter of the Dark. Um, I think because it is, uh, well, for, for, for a number of things. I, I, I like the idea of this sort of, you know, this, this building dread, this building up to something that, I don't want to say it, 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 it's 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 not that it never it never comes because it does, but it doesn't come in the way that the people expect it to. You know, uh, I, I like that it is a uh, almost like a back and forth between Robert Block and H.P. Lovecraft. Which when when I first started, I had sort of reservations about. It. I was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> is this this sort of self-referencing or, or like friend referencing thing? Um, it, it is it going to detract from the story? But it really doesn't. I mean, it, it's there's a there's a sort of glee there, a sort of joy there. I, I was talking about this with uh, um, uh, on another podcast yesterday, actually, about you know Stephen King's early work, where there's a certain glee, a certain joy in writing. Uh, a story that's that's fun and and creepy and that you know sort of encompasses the things that you love about writing horror. And every time I read *Haunter of the Dark*, that's the impression I get. I know it's not necessarily one of you know Lovecraft's favorites, but I, you can feel that joy in there. And I think it's because there is that sort of back and forth with Robert Block with the you know the three stories that are connected, um, and. I think that's what comes through for me is that that almost it's almost the, the the kind of joy that you get when you read like the the early works of writers like once they finally get the hang of writing, but uh, really still have it, it's not a chore for them it's not a job for them it's still fun, and I, I, that's that's what I get from from that one and I think that like anytime I sort of need a writing pick me up, I reread you know like that story. Or you know some of some of Lovecraft's earlier stuff, um, or some of Ramsey Campbell's stuff. Don't tell him uh, <laughs> because <laughs> it, it it reminds me of why I like doing this, you know, and and why it's fun and uh, why it's you know worth sitting down and, and typing, you know, sitting down and putting a day typing, putting a day in writing. Mike, do you have a... Stunned you all into silence. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I, I love that story. I, I, I want to reread that now, because you're right, Mary. I think it does tap into this kind of dark joy. Like, you know, it's hard. Right. It's weird to talk about joy and horror in the same breath. <laughs> but uh, I like that you did that. And Robert Block, I now that I think about it, was always a joyful read for me whenever I turned to one of his stories. I mean, I love his short story collections most of all. It's, uh, uh, you know, beyond Psycho and everything like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think of short stories, too. And, and one that comes to mind is something I'm going to be uh, teaching at the next StokerCon. Uh, and it, it's David Silva's short story, The Calling, oh. which, uh, you know, it came out, what, in the early 90s, late 80s? Um, it, it was uh, anthologized by Ellen Dallow in one of the year's best, but it originally appeared in the horror show, which, uh, as I I've told Lauren before, is like, you know, I love that magazine so much. <laughs> like the magazine I wish I could have been in. I know Brian, Brian is all over that one. Uh, damn it. Uh, with some awesome work. I took um, up your spaces. <laughs> <laughs> Graphic artist is the first thing I've read from Brian, and that's where it came from, so. Yeah, so I mean that's a great magazine, but uh, but the calling—I I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it—but uh, it's a masterwork of sort of guilt and the pain of losing a loved one, and 
it brings in the supernatural and the unknown through the context of, of, of psychology, really, the psychology of guilt. And to me, that kind of dualism between the supernatural and the psychological is what makes horror really work for me, uh, beyond the humor and the absurd and the over-the-top craziness of it all, which I always love. I just love cracking my skull open, really. Uh, <laughs> and Ramsey's always good for that. But, but Ramsey's also really good for that psychological focus. And, uh, you know, The Face That Must Die was a book that really made a huge impression on me uh, when I was getting started. So, uh, one to write, I'll tell you that. <laughs> But anyway, I could go on and on. I bet we all could because this this genre is just such a rich tap tapestry of uh, yeah, of pleasure and pain. <laughs> Mark, do you have something? Uh, well, I always have to mention um, Clive Barker's short story "In the Hills, the Cities," mm -hmm. just for the very audacity of it. Because um, I mean, the concept, the structure of it is the bickering couple that's traveling and finds themselves in a strange small town, which is a very familiar setup. But then what he does with it is so unexpected and kind of insane. It's a concept that if you try to explain it to people, almost shouldn't work. It should come mm -hmm. off almost comedic. But he does it in a way that, I mean, I just admire the audacity of it and then the skill he implemented to make it actually work as a terrifying and believable story. Like, yeah, that was the first time I ever read of, of, of Clive's, actually, because you know, he gave me the manuscript of the first three books of Blood to read uh, before it was published. Um, he you know, just said, you know, maybe I, I, I'd advised him on the contract for the publisher because his, his agent was a theatrical agent. Yeah. Therefore, he, he wanted somebody in, in, you know, in the book world, basically. And I, I, read, I read that and... My, my jaw, I think, stayed dropped for um, some little time thereafter, you know. And I remember telling Peter Straw about it and saying, Bingo, I remember raving to Peter next time. I thought, you know, there's this new guy you want to read. You're going you to be seeing his book out next year. Make sure you grab it. And I just told Peter, the, you know, just the basis of In the Hills and Cities. And he said, you know, basically, there's a, there's a genius right there. And indeed, I think I might say he then told Steve King, which is where that original you know, um, enthusiasm for Clive's work from Steve came from on a panel. So there's a, from all, all from that one reader, there you are. So I must be doing something right if I got, to, you know, got Clive, the, the word out about Clive. Well, sorry, can... sorry. Well, Ramsey's given me a good lead in here uh, because, because it's one of Peter Straub's works that, uh, that I think I'm going to go with and I'm going to be the odd the odd one out here. I I I think everybody else is is focused on a a short short story. I'm gonna go with um with with Peter Staub's uh, fairly early novel Shadow Shadowland, oh, really? and that to me was maybe maybe the first time I had the experience of um, of reading something that not only do you remember the novel itself, but you remember the, no the experience of reading the novel. Uh, uh, to me, there's a distinction. You know, there are things that I remember, but I don't remember where I was or what I was doing when I was reading them. And, and that, I, that one, I can picture myself in, in, in my apartment at college reading this and being um, probably to the detriment of my my studies being captivated by this vacillation between real world stuff and 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 just these forays into the into the uh, kind of a dark fairy tale world uh the fantastical and the novel just stayed and it, it was it, it preceded the uh it, it tapped into something that i that, that, that I, I personally found very interesting because and, and appealing because I didn't have the experience of it, but part of it takes place in a, um, in what you might consider a, a, a prep school or a, or, or a, a, a private school that uh, a boarding school, and um, so that prefigured the Harry Potter thing. But I found that world very interesting and the the dynamics that were going on um, in the school and and uh, the. Uh, the 
the character that was kind of frightening to everybody, Skeleton Ridpath, I think was his name. Um, so that, yeah, that was the, the first time that I, I really related to a book, I think, in that, to that degree, where, where the, whole, the whole thing became an, an experience unto itself that I could, that I could hang on to in, in, in more than just the narrative, but uh, that, yeah, that I got captivated and pulled into this into this world that uh, that made me leave my own uh, that that should have taken precedence at the time. But no, I want to go live here for a while. So that was it. Nice. Hey, Gam, do you have a, a favorite work in the genre? Um. Oh gosh. Um. <laughs> uh. One of, I mean, there, there's like just, God, there's so many to choose from, but uh, one of my favorites is, um, I mean, based upon the fact that I've like reread it at least half a dozen times, would be uh, Fog Heart by Thomas Tessier, um, who um, I had mentioned when I was on, on here previously that he is uh, he's my writing mentor. And, um, and yeah, I just, I love it. I love a, a really good, ghost story and um i mean i even named my cat after the main character una <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing um so can i pick up something that, that, that mary said which, i mean just generally address everybody to this but or address this for everybody i beg your pardon but um I, i'll answer it myself but you know this, this whole thing about joy of the joy of creating horror you know i mean you know i very much share that and I mean basically you know if I get a, a new image basically or, or you know, a new let alone a new concept Lord knows they're, they're hard enough to come by but you know a, a new so, so something that appears not to have been done before that that, that you know some summons up the, the uncanny for me that which is what I particularly yes. like writing yes um you know there's, I mean I, I you know I, I I'm I will be seen to grin maniacally because I you know <laughs> I, I found something new you know and and, and while I'm writing it and I suppose it's partly to do with just the simple joy of creativity, but I think there seems to be a particular uh, aspect of this in terms of, well, of our kind of horror, if you like. That's certainly it's the way it plays for me in the, in, while I'm writing it. Is that true mainly for everybody? I think? I I think for for me, you know, there's the 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 excitement of coming up with, like you said, like with the with the idea that. Oh, oh! I've got my. You know, this is <laughs> this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun to do. It. Um, that's that's the sustaining thing. And I I used to tell people that's why I write things out of order. I know it's 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 a weird process, but I I very rarely ever write anything linearly from the beginning of the novel to the end. I write the scene that is the most fun for me, that gives me that feeling, and then I work my way out from that. I write all the fun scenes. And then I go back to the beginning and I connect them because if I try to write things linearly, then I feel like mentally I'm thinking I'm slogging through the, you know, the connecting parts. But if I write it out of order and I write all the, the joy stuff first, then I can go back almost with a fresh eye. And instead of making the connecting piece is something I have to kind of slog through to get to the good stuff again, I can find new ways to make them, even the connecting piece is fun. So then it kind of keeps that whole process fresh. So I never, you know, so I won't lose steam during writing of the book. Cause I think that's like anything I've tried to write linearly, I've found that I've lost, I, I've, I've lost steam as I've gone because I, it, because it, it doesn't have the same um, renewed little outbursts of, of, of that fun, of that, that joy, that, that original, Oh hey, <laughs> this is this is why I do this. This is this is fun. I I'm so not wired to ever attempt what you're talking about. <laughs> I know most people most people think it is absolutely an insane way to approach writing a book, but I feel so like you. Go, I feel like your grocery shopping is a lot of going like back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I There's no rhyme or reason to it, really. <laughs> Yeah, my experiences of writing things out of order have usually been very accidental. It, it, it's like finding 
finding this mess you've got and it's like reassembling the puzzle you know so um there's a, a lot of chop, a lot of chopping up and sliding around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what well, one of the good things about writing things out of order is you can kind of do that the only as far as I'm concerned, the only real drawback is that I have to keep extensive notes about what I've done, say, in some mystical chapter eight that doesn't exist yet, so that I remember to get to that point that it can happen that way. But yeah, the, time, the times that I've done it deliberate, deliberately, it's usually to stay with a particular character's point of view. It's like, I, okay, I see the world through this point, this pair of eyes. I don't want to keep breaking off to go to somebody else's eyes because they see the world differently. So, so I'll, I'll stay with them a while and then move to the other person a while and then write what I know that's going to happen and then chop it up and, and rearrange it in, in, in order later. So that, that works. But as far as, uh, individual scenes, I don't think I could do, I, I don't think I could. <laughs> Cause I don't know that much about it, um, going, going through. So I, I, I don't, I don't have this long, this list of, of of highlights that I want to get out of front load and get out of the way early because it's 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 going to be the most exciting. So I I don't know that far ahead. <laughs> hey, can I pipe in? Uh, like, uh, some writers call themselves like you know pantsers. They're writing by the seat of their pants, right? And and then there's plotters who would like plot out methodically their outline and just follow it. Mary or some something else. I'm like <laughs> underwear or something. I, like dancing is just writing <laughs> that I'm like, I don't know, I'm like bikini briefs sliding <laughs> sliding yeah. through the book somehow. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I can picture that. Uh, but I was gonna say that um, I think there's a joy to kind of being what Poe called the imp of the perverse which is kind of like almost like a dungeon master kind of like you're organizing things and setting up the haunted house like you know your reader is going to enter a room and then you're going to spring a surprise on them so there's that sick glee <laughs> of setting people up for the horror and designing outlining plotting that all taps into that that kind of poe machina machinations of poe but there's also the 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 jouissance of the moment where you're writing and you maybe you're in a paragraph and it just explodes with maybe gore or something wild and crazy like the the descriptions of the elder god's universe and 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 suddenly you're in it like a psychedelic trip and that's a joy too uh i better shut up about that psychedelic part because <laughs> I know some of you could comment extensively on that. Oh, we could, we could, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there, you know, there's, 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 there's many more joys. But to me, those are the top two in terms of the writing process of horror. Uh, and and I love to, I love that we're talking about this subject. Jeez. <laughs> when I think about it, what, what, what I like probably well, as much as anything about writing is what, what I, I like to come to my desk every day and surprise myself. Basically, mm -hmm. write something I didn't know I was going to write until I got there, you know. And um, yeah, that's one of the great pleasures of, of of doing it. I think, and that's why I actually have to. I don't plot anymore. You know, you know I've got a lot of material. I, I know approximately what's going to go in, but not mm -hmm. where it goes necessarily. And you know, I, I like to find, you know, take the journey and find out. Um, which means, you know, sometimes I find myself out in the middle of nowhere, knowing what the hell I got there. And, and, and in a state of utter panic, but you know, the fact that I'm now old enough to trust my instinct, you know, I, there's something that will tell me where to go next, and so far there has been. Randy, is that is that due to how extensively or how well you know the characters and they they take over? Is that there's a bit of that certainly, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think it's it's more sort of relaxing to the process. Okay. Because you know? I because I I like getting to the point more of a novel than a short story that uh, because you've got the time to get to know the characters but get to the, to the point where they kind of take over or at least meet you halfway where you can sit down in the morning and uh, okay what's everybody up to great let's go with that so. mm -hmm. and i think that that extends to um I mean obviously it extends to both the protagonist and the antagonist but i think it also extends to the setting to a point because i think that in a lot of great horror stories the setting is almost a character in and of itself 
And I think if you understand the setting like that, if you understand it as almost a an entity, you know, a, a contained entity in and of itself, then you can kind of trust just, okay, you know, let's see where this takes us because not only are the characters behaving in a way that's consistent, but so is the setting, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think that kind of character and setting are almost the same thing from from a craft's point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, how a, how a, a character interprets the setting, and that's they, your they filter for, mm -hmm. uh, for how you perceive how the the reader is going to perceive it. So. I know one thing that I love to do is create the world around the story that doesn't specifically relate to the plot, mm -hmm. because. I feel like that can make the story feel more authentic because in our own lives, no matter what great tragedy we may be going through, other stuff is happening. So I actually have a lot of fun building the lives the characters have that aren't related to the plot. And, you know, I may have a scene where it's important that somebody gets a phone call and gets certain information, but where they are when they get that phone call, they could be anywhere. So it's sort of, I have fun deciding where they are, what they're doing, and maybe it has nothing to do with the plot, but I feel like it enhances the story, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what I also find is often enough, this thing about, you know, being out in the middle of nowhere in, in the writing, that, you know, the stuff I may have put in early on that I just, you know, I thought was just a kind of, you know, background detail, you know, just a, a little bit of, you know, to give it a bit more sense of reality. and. You know, all of a sudden it becomes a prop that I can use. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, that sort of shows me where I need to go now. Uh, and I, I was not aware of this. I mean, often a lot of this stuff of mine, you know, looks as if I've developed it consciously. But no, often enough, you know, stuff I put in there very early on is is, is the seed of something that comes later that that I had no idea of when I put it in in the first place. Um, you know, it's a, well, it's kind of a balancing trick to pull off. But um, I'm learning still. I'm learning. <laughs> if you're still learning, we're in such trouble. <laughs> but it's always good to, to be learning and to continue learning. And, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but it probably means we're in remedial class at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm still old, eating cakes. I'm the old folks, I'm dry, so, you know, you're better off than I am. Um, you, so I just want to mention, like, uh, I have uh, kind of a record you know uh photo flash tie for my favorite novel of all time and on what it depends on what day you ask me but um william peter blatty's uh, legion can easily win mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um a novel called prototype by brian hodge can also win but we're not going to discuss that because i want to talk about <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, my favorite short story in the horror genre of all time is dennis etchison's it only comes at night and i thought that was going to open up a lot of conversation and then i realized that uh, that got collected in Dark Country, which has an introduction by Ramsey Campbell. So it all kind of stays in this cube here, right? <laughs> um, I think that the short story is so vital to our genre, more so than anything maybe except for mystery as the only other genre that really embraces uh, the short story as a format as, as m often. Mm. And we also see the market kind of recoiling over time from the short story. And I, I find that disturbing, to be honest with you, because I think horror works in a lot of different lengths, but short stories are so important. Does anyone have any feelings on the short story's place, where it should be? Well, I, I love the short story. The short story was the first form I fell in love with as a reader and a writer, I think. So I have a lot of passion for it. And I do recognize that sometimes, particularly if you're not a known name, um, publishers are a little more wary about doing like collections and things like that. But, um, but I have such a, a passion. Oh. Yeah. I have such a passion for it. I don't care, which maybe is a good thing or, or maybe not. So I just keep writing them. But, um, yeah, I know early on when I was publishing, it was very hard for me to convince a publisher to do a collection with me. Um, and I had to do a few novels and novellas first, but, um, I think I have 13 short story collections out now. So it excites me when I can get a publisher excited because, you know, it may be dwindling, but I do think the short story does have a good, a strong place in the horror genre. And I, I mean, I love reading short story collections. I love writing short stories. I love anthologies. So 
for me, I guess I don't follow the market as much. I just know it's what I love and it's what I'm passionate about. Well, with short stories, concessions to form are a lot less important than they are with something that's of a of a of a novel length. You can you can get you know you get going on on kind of a, a, an experimental tangent in a, in a short story mm -hmm. that you can't sustain, um, or, or just the way you play with the characters and uh, and the setting and the perceptions that once you get much past novella length. It, you're going to have to start thinking in terms of the of of uh, structural conceits and things like that that you just don't have to worry about as much with a with a, with a short story. So, and I think that because they can be read in a in a single setting, you've got that that immersion trip payoff all in all all encapsulated in in just one one go, whether where that's not going to be the case with a novel usually <laughs> you know I, I always think metaphorically so like to me a short story is the ride or the attraction at the amusement park and the novel is the amusement park so <laughs> you know it, it's it's and there are all sorts of different rides there's more variability variety uh like the experimental nature of the short story that you're talking about brian that's everything and, you know, I wrote a book called 100 Jolts. It's 100 flash fictions. They're very, very short. Some are like two sentences long. And I just wanted to kind of explore and, and apply horror to these different formats and writing poetry, writing short shorts or micro fiction, or even just throwing something up on Twitter. <laughs> those, are <laughs> those are preposterous, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's part of that joy we were talking about before with the kind of playful experimentation. With novels, you're, you're, you're doing it in all the different kind of main areas of, of fiction, right? So like your grand experiment might be with the setting or your grand experiment might be with a certain character that you've invented like a monster or something. So like, I think that the experimentation is still there, but short story writing kind of just gives you this sharp focus and you know you can dispense with it in a week or something like that uh but uh, you know i think it all comes back to poe again I, I i really do i think poe's influence on our genre really has a lot to do with this difference between the short story and the novel and while writers have long been working in the long form uh you know it wasn't until the blockbusters of the 70s where horror novels became conceptualized as we think of them now uh, at least in my opinion uh, so like, you know, Ira Levin, William Blatty, uh, and Stephen King, right? Like these writers made a huge transformative kind of step forward for what we do uh, as authors and made it marketable, really. I mean, I don't think, you know, some of us would be able to have the living that we have as authors uh, or had, <laughs> perhaps, uh, <laughs> thanks to, uh, you know, the boom of bestseller paperbacks. I never understood marketing wise why uh, why bigger publishers tended to back away from short stories. I mean, especially in horror, because I think that more often than not, a shorter form for horror is more effective. And also, I don't know, like like it, like uh, Arzu was talking about metaphors, you know, and and. Uh, to me, you know, a short story is almost like a, a first date. You know, if I like you, <laughs> then I may read your novel, you know. So uh, once you kind of get past that first date, you, you get a sense of how they're, and I know it's a different skill set. Short, writing a short story and writing a novel are, are kind of two different skill sets. But um, but I do think there's a, a sense there of the aesthetic of the author, of the uh, style, you know, of the kind of content, the kind of themes that are important to a writer, and in a in a a tightly you know encapsulated format. And to me, it would make sense to uh, you know if you're you know introducing a new author, let's say, uh, that's how I found honestly. That's how I found most of you guys is is I read anthologies, and there were short stories by you in there, and I was like, oh, I really like that short story. You know, I'm I'm going to read. I'm going to read his novel, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to read her, you know, her next novella, you know, and 
I think it's it's a good introductory kind of thing. And I, I guess, I, I like I, marketing is not my thing really. So maybe I'm I'm missing a point here somewhere. But I never understood why they were so hesitant, unless somehow the reader thinks they're being shortchanged mm. in a short story collection because they're not embarking on this long, epic novel length adventure with with the book that they're buying or something. Yeah. Mary, I've I've read your fiction and you need to rethink dates. Dates? Yeah. They shouldn't end that way. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Mary for a long time. I'm allowed to joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean <laughs> now that you mention it. <laughs> you know, I, I think Mary has a point. I do know people who like they think a novella is just a skimpy novel. Mm. And don't understand that the novella is its own thing. It's yeah. as long as it needs to be. Um, yeah. So I do think some people probably do see short fiction as just, oh, well, they just didn't finish the story and not understanding mm. it is its own complete world. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I think as also, and Mark and I have discussed this, but um, as the market for reading has gotten smaller over the years, I think the people who remain reading tend to want large bites. You know, in general, and I, I, I the publish listen, publishers would publish, you know, recipes for cheesecake if that's what sold enough copies. Ultimately, um, I think readers as a market have shrunk, and I think that they want more. Those that are remaining want more, so the novel makes sense to them. But I think for our genre in particular, um, there's a lot that gets missed out when we don't have as much of the short form popularly available. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously short, small press and self-publishing and whatnot. And but, uh, Mike, by the way, I wanted to say that um, every Twitter post is a horror story. Every single one. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you gotta love Twitter. You gotta love it. You know, your uh, cheesecake point, uh, you know, there recently was an anthology called Slasher Tort, you know, uh, which is short stories about cakes and horror. I mean, so like one of the elements of short fiction with our genre is, again, that variability or the variety of like you can apply horror to any topic and have an anthology concept. It's, it's kind of cool when 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 good anthologies are published and, and publishers do take a risk on them. But with single authors, I think, Mary, what you said, and, and Mark touched on this too, that these stories are introductions to an author and their larger opus, like you could buy their collection or their novel or whatever. But mass market publishing is so kind of wrapped up with brand naming, right, branding, so that, you know, a Ramsey Campbell novel is a Ramsey Campbell novel, and in a way it transcends horror. Uh, no, 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 I would argue with that, but. <laughs> I could see why you'd argue with that. I would argue with it too if someone said it about me. But <laughs> I think in publishing, they often want to f sell the author as a brand so that their contracts, you know, they just want to sell all those books written by that author. And so that's why novels come into play more than short stories, I think, in, in the mindset of like Random House or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, funny enough, it's not new, is it? I mean, when you, you, you remember the reason Arkham House was set up was because the New York publishers did not want to do a collection of Lovecraft's mm -hmm. short stories, or indeed, you know, shorter and longer. I mean, not several of which are novellas anyway, but, you know, and that was why The Outsider and I, others were put together, you know, as an Arkham House book, which is how Arkham House came to be. But even back in 39, you know, it was ever thus, really. Yeah, and I think that relates to small press publishing today, especially. Uh, yeah. Like, I will only, you know, share my work with publishers I trust now, right? Based on what they've published, who they've published, uh, and what their kind of aesthetic might be. Mm -hmm. It's actually a completely random thought, but just because you, you reminded me of this, Michael, last night I dreamt that I met my old friend Peter Atkins, mm -hmm. and he was working on a screenplay about scented malevolent biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know oh, what? Let me, not, let me not divert the conversation. Well, how would you feel if you came out of an oven? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be a lot more concerned about going into the oven. <laughs> Love it. How do so? 
that actually is a nice little transition because like so how do we live the writing life today because obviously the the entire substrate has changed if you were to take someone from the 1960s and show them today's publishing world they would not recognize it as the same business in many ways i think so how do you how do how do we live this i'm obviously day jobs are involved i'm not asking for that but how do we get to the point where as um we're living through the creative process. How do how do we live our regular lives and still make time and make it worth it? And obviously, I'm not talking about passion. We all are passionate about what we do, but at the end of the day, the uh, electrical bill is still coming, right? Well, I mean, I've got to confess. Uh, I'll get out of the way very quickly that I do it full time. Um, you know, lucky me. And I mean, I'm doing the stuff I want to do, and I'm doing it all the time. But anyway, I'll leave it to everybody else now. One other thing I, I've learned, um, you know, just partially from uh, having been in a situation where I've almost kind of had to, uh, I guess, transition from, you know, uh, I guess having a full-time job to, you know, teaching part-time and writing uh, is that it, it's a hustle. Like, it's, it's always lining up things uh, you know, always talking to publishers almost like two or three books ahead in, in order to make sure that everything is, you know, that you're, you're, you kind of have a, you always have a plan. You always have a direction to, to go into. Um, and that and, and diversifying. I mean, we learned, I think, the hard way with leisure that you can't put all your books in one basket, in any one publisher's basket. In. And I think that, um, you know, my generation of writers in particular is sort of in this unique position to have seen how publishing uh, was in the 60s and 70s and then the 80s and 90s and then when most of us started, I guess, with like the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, and then how it is now. And having watched that evolution, I think we can draw on both experience and still be able to adapt to the changes that, that come along and make this sort of hybrid model to secure, I mean, you know, I, and I, 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 you guys, you know, you would, would probably, you know, it, it, everybody probably has a plan, you know, like where you do, you do some traditional publishing, some self-publishing, some small press publishing, and it kind of fits whatever your budget is. I mean, I live in, Pennsylvania, it's pretty cheap here, you know, for the most part. So it's not like, you know, and, and I, you know, I live with Brian who makes a, you know, pretty good living from writing. So between the two of us, we do okay. But I think if you were to live in New York city or in New Jersey, where I grew up or in, you know, in, you know, New England somewhere, you might have to rethink your strategy or, you know, we shift your reallocate your, you know, how you're, how you're, building your career, I guess. I, I find that having a spouse that really supports and encourages me helps a lot. Um, my husband always makes sure that I have the time I need to write. He's always, he's always interested in us having adventures that he think will inspire me to come up with story ideas. And that helps a lot. And I also, I only write the stuff that I think will be fun. Like I don't write stuff that I think will be marketable, although I hope it will be, but I write the stuff that's going to get me excited to get up in the morning to do it. And I have, you know, when I was 20, I thought I was going to be, you know, Stephen King and I'd be living, you know, making a living on my writing. And my expectations have become more realistic. It's have a day job that I don't hate. Mm -hmm. And that gives me time to always write. So I have realistic expectations, a spouse that supports me, and I'm always having fun. Yeah, I'd love to hear from the other people too, but I just wanted to quickly jump in and say, I think there's a difference between like writing as a vocation and writing as a careerist, you know? Uh, and if you're just doing what, what you love to do and surrounding yourself or immersing yourself in all things horror, if you're a lover of horror, 
then that's all that matters, right? So, like, I get to teach horror full time, as Mary knows. Uh, uh, I get to write it in my free time. Uh, I'm constantly reading it or watching films, and I think all of us kind of can can see ourselves in that kind of immersion in it. Uh, it's sad when the the real world is so depressing it pulls you out of that. But you know, I, I kind of feel like if I didn't teach writing and horror that I'd probably like try to work in a morgue or something, you know, and find something related <laughs> to what I love to do <laughs> as a kind of research. And you could still take your work home with you. <laughs> yes. In fact, I, I plan to retire in the morgue, to be honest. I, say, I, I know by sense of humor, I, I can picture like, you know, him drawing little, little mustaches on people. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could see that. All over their bodies. <laughs> <laughs> the fun wow. back in funeral, you know? <laughs> well, Gam, why don't you go? I, I, I think uh, I think Lauren would, is probably saving me for last here. So Yeah, it, okay. it, it was a little bit of a setup. I, w I was kind of okay being the quiet weirdo at the bottom of the screen. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm just learning a lot by... Um, you know, listening to all of you and your experiences. Um, well, I guess as far as writing life, I mean, yeah, I've, I've got the day job. Um, and working from home in the pandemic has kind of made things a little challenging. I haven't done a whole lot in the last year. Um, the biggest thing I probably did was uh, collaborating on a story with, uh, with Ed. Um, and you know, it, it's it's good to have, uh, like like Mark had mentioned, it's it's like it's the greatest thing to have a partner that supports you. And and Ed, he, you know, obviously he's written so much stuff and he gets it. Um, and you know, and he pushes me to try to write more. But um, he he pretty much just stays at home and he writes like every single day. He does freelance work to kind of help out with the bills because. Um, I think I think you had mentioned it, Mary, about uh, um, living in New England. Uh, it's it's not cheap. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm lucky. I'm in a town where where the um, you know where you know they have their own electric company, so like the rates are like I don't know, like three times cheaper. So, but you know, there's still rent. There's you know the cat mm -hmm. and other expenses and stuff. So it's um, I mean, luckily I make enough where you know we're getting by and can pay the rent and then he helps out you know with his freelance work and royalties and stuff but um i've been trying to push myself to get back into it more and not gonna lie some days it's it's just it's tough and i know some of it is just um i guess outside things you know like you know try to stay away from social media because it's mm -hmm. just it's it's awful and it just really drags you down and stuff and um but uh i don't, I don't know that's, that's all i got at the moment <laughs> and you should stay away from social media because that's how i contact people so <laughs> yeah he definitely you're safer not to have to deal with me if you avoid social media <laughs> <laughs> And now we know. <laughs> My, no, yeah, okay, this is a, yeah, this is a, a, a tangent unto itself, I, I, I suspect. And anything I say here is is subject to the Bruce Lee rule. You know, absorb what's useful, discard what's useless, add what is uniquely your own. And uh, but for the past twenty odd years, until until fairly recently. I never, this was something I never spoke about um, publicly because I think for a lot of us growing up, the lessons that we absorbed was that, that money was kind of like Fight Club. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't talk about Fight Club and we don't talk about money. So what got me to, to reconsider this was a, um, a shared incident uh, or, or situation about a year and a half ago when a publisher that a number of us were, a number of us were involved with uh, to one degree or another they had managed to keep a good public reputation for a long time 
But oh, right. uh, one big crack in the dam opened up uh, and, and Gam's eye, pupils are probably dilating right now. So. <laughs> but uh, we one started big, on them. <laughs> one big crack in the dam really opened up a, a flood of allegations about financial malfeasance and, and how badly that a lot of people were getting treated. And, and so at that time I was seeing uh, and, and feeling very badly for a lot of people who were on social media in, in obvious distress, you know, am I going to get paid here? Am I, am I totally boned? At the, at the time, the difference was that while a thing like that might have made, could, could certainly have the power to make me mad, it didn't have the power to make me scared. Um, so like Ramsey, I've been doing this, this full time for, for a very long time. I only worked, um, uh, a day job my first five years out of college. And then at that point I sold, sold my first two novels back to back. So I was able to, and this is a very easy thing to do in your, in your mid twenties is, is, is to, to quit and go for your dream. Um, so I, I started writing full time at that point. Um, and, but uh, kind of the double edged sword about that is that it is very, it's a very hard thing to contemplate giving up once you have that freedom. And once I had that freedom, I really wanted to maintain it. So, um, so the big opportunity for me to, to, to do that came really your life can change from, from a single event. A lot of times it's a confluence of events of things or, uh, things that happen kind of concurrently. So what happened was that with, the, with my seventh novel, it sold at auction. So I had four four major publishing houses bidding for it, um, and uh, so once all that went through, I had what felt at the time like a, a tsunami of cash coming in, and I was fortunate enough around that time to, and that's the kind of situation you hope just keeps rolling, um, mm -hmm. but at the time I had the good fortune to kind of blunder across information that that really surprised me. It, it was an unlikely source here. It was, I, I learned that, that Joey Ramon was an avid investor. And that's not a thing I would have expected out of him. Um, because this is a, the tall, gawky, beanpole looking guy who sings about sniffing glue and being lobotomized. So, um, but uh, the, the, the thing that, that really surprised me was his, his, admission that he made far more from investing than he ever made from from music mm. and the unspoken corollary that I that I extrapolated from that was that he the investing was what had enabled him to keep doing music on his, on his own terms mm. and I, you know I would have thought he was doing fine because you'd see him all seeing on, on MTV I knew he did uh, I knew he did some product behind the scenes production work so I really took this on board and, and thought, well, now, you know, here's, here's my chance. I've got this, I've got this living close to the bone thing down. I can keep doing that. And so at that point I became an investor as well. Um, and then also spent about, about 10 years. The term side hustle wasn't, uh, wasn't in use then, but I, I did a lot of, uh, regular work for a magazine publishing group for uh, computers, consumer electronics, um, IT professionals, I'm doing a lot of work along those lines for 40 cents a word, which which adds up quickly. So I was able to to continue putting things uh, putting things aside. So that has that in and itself has made uh, over over you know 20 years, 20 plus years has made all the difference um, and it's enabled me to to really pursue a lot of a lot of interests like uh, you, know, you know like putting together a, a, a studio here only which you're seeing only a fraction of um, it, it's just made made a night and day difference in how I get to live my life and how and I'm for which I'm extremely grateful um, and so I started to open up about that uh, a little bit more a year and a half ago when I saw the, the kind of distress that people, people have. Um, 
but the uh, the thing that that also made a big difference was when I started uh, started thinking in terms of systems um, and how I you know because everything starts in the mind um, and how I how I began to regard this growing body of um, intellectual property call it and how it's there to work for me same as dollars that I've earned that have come in has started to work for me. So one thing that I do now is uh, I have this system and, and system thinking of if, probably the, the most interesting take on that that I've seen has come from the guy that created Dilbert, Scott Adams. Um, he's turned into kind of a wing nut in recent years, but that doesn't negate the kind of uh, the good that I've got out of, of, of talking about when, how he became a cartoonist. Um, and his one quote of his that gets misconstrued, I think, sometimes that he's got this quote that losers have goals, winners have systems. Uh, that's pretty much what it boils down to. It doesn't negate the, the presence of goals. It's just that goals without a system by which to achieve them are, 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 are essentially are essentially dreams mm -hmm. but once you have a, a system in place to start achieving things um that's that's when you start making progress you know and if you were to sit down at eight o'clock every morning and write for three hours that's a system though so he regards systems and in, in those terms of, of act, taking action but you know one thing i do so getting back to the money thing one thing i've done for quite some time is is that anything that comes in, it's like <clears throat> I shave off a certain amount to go into, uh, I have a lot of different bank accounts and, and investment accounts. And, um, a certain amount goes into a tax estimates account that I don't, that I, that I don't even consider owning anymore. I, 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 I don't aggregate it as far as the full net worth. Um, 10% goes into the investment accounts. Another 10% goes into long-term savings. Another 10% goes into um, a kind of a dream bucket, which is is just for like travel or, or a pricey acquisition or something like that. So, um, so that's my system for keeping, for hoping to keep the net worth growing. And um, so the, um, the system as far as what comes in and goes out the cash flow um so it's it's, it's interest it's dividends it's capital appreciation it's royalties new book advance um film rights has, has become a I've, I've in the past three years i've had more interest in film rights than i ever had through the, the previous 25 years so that's a course so it's all so to me, it's all it's all thinking of it in, in one lump sum mm -hmm. or one lump system as far as how do I continue to maintain my freedom? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's so a lot of when that's your goal, when you know what your overriding goal is, a lot of decisions then get get easier to make. So that's just as far as an introduction, what I would have to say about that. That's uh, that's a good point. I mean, every all the advice that I've that I you know that I've been given from writers who do this full time and who've been doing it successfully full time is that you need to plan ahead. You know, mm -hmm. and that is that's just that's not even just in terms of money, although that's important. You know, you need to set aside a certain amount for taxes and yeah. for savings and for the inevitable surprise emergency that's going to come up. You know, um, when your partner sets himself on fire. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which is one thing in a chain of many things that the man does to himself. But, you know, <laughs> um, uh, but also, I think uh, you know, insurance. I mean, although you know, I, although we're all so young and vibrant, you see, eventually we will get older, and you know, we will need you know different medical things come up and and i everybody that i've talked to they all say just you know plan ahead have you know just have a plan you know like you said have a system where you can make the most of what you're getting and i think it was 
was it you, Brian, that mentioned um, foreign rights for things? Like once you've written a book, maybe, yeah. Um, once you've written a book, you know, you, you I guess you, you want to optimize the use of that book. So you know, yeah. you sell the foreign rights, you sell the audiobook rights, you sell, you know. God willing, you know, get an option for for movie or television, and you make the most of everything that you're doing, and you know, other other than certain you know certain circumstances, you don't work for free, you know. Yeah, that's what I that's what I was meaning by this this body of intellectual property. It's got mm -hmm. you know, you've got a lot of employees then, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you think of them in those terms, that, that are there to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, so you can keep doing what you love to do, hopefully. Um, so that, you know, once I started thinking in terms of, in, in those terms, that it was just another thing clicking into place, really. Um, I, I'd love to, I love what you said, Brian. That was a great kind of, it was an inspiring and, and something people need to keep in mind when they're getting started, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, this is, this is an art form. Uh, it kind of runs on a gift economy, especially in the small press. And so you got to kind of maybe get started that way, but think long term. And I think the word investment to me means not just investing in yourself or in those properties, but to invest in your genre as well. I, I can't tell you how many beginning writers I talk to who don't read. <laughs> and to me, reading is, is an investment in your craft and your writing kind of repertoire or, or personality you have to spend the time uh reading researching even if it's just your book premise you got to spend money going to conferences or to buy the books of your peers uh these are part of the business uh you know and it, it's it's ultimately investing in yourself and your growth mm -hmm. but it also is participating in the economy of our genre <laughs> and a lot of beginning writers don't even think about that because they're so self-centered about what they're doing. And some of that survival tactics, like I'm a starving artist, all I can care about is selling this property. And it's, it's not really about that. I think the generosity of what we do is still connected to that gift economy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I've said enough about that. I think Ramsey pointed at his glasses. Are those new glasses, Ramsey? <laughs> <laughs> These are just my reading time passer. Um, uh -huh. The other ones are much more elegant, much more elegant. Um, I just want to pick up on something that Gam and uh, Mark said that you know, just come back once again to supportive partners. I mean, um, oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sitting here as, as, as if I'm in a sort of eminence grease who's you know, made made it all, and, and, uh, and I'm well, I'm comfortable actually, but that's beside the point. The fact is, you know, my first book was published in '64. I didn't go full time until '73, and I've been mainly right. Well, I've been actually I've been absolutely writing nothing, nothing but short stories up to that point. And that's, it was only because my wife Jenny um, said, "Basically, you know, go for it, and you know, I'll, I'll support you. You know, we'll see if it works out." I mean, she supported us for five years. Otherwise, you know, I would not be here sitting talking to you and you know everybody else right now and and i have to say there have been dips in dips in it as well i mean around the turn of the century i actually did go and work in a borders bookshop for for half a year or so mind you i got a novel out of it so that's uh that's my excuse and in fact you know it just looked as if our our finances were imploding it wasn't quite as bad as it looked but you know it still can happen um well, see, so, your wife invested in you so well mm -hmm. that's absolutely right yeah and um, <laughs> Without her, I would not be half the person I am, you know? So she's the best part of my life. Aww. And you know, there's a biosphere to horror as a community. Um, I think what M Mike said was so unbelievably important. It is important to support wherever you can, especially the stuff you're really passionate about. And that doesn't mean necessarily always buying, although money changing hands is important, very important. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the reasons this channel exists is because I want to make sure that as many people hear about important artists that are with us today. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart to think, uh, not just about, we can all talk about H.P. Lovecraft thinking he was good, but dying broke and going to be forgotten. But, you know, even like Algernon Blackwood or uh, Henry Kuttner, Mm -hmm. Outside a very specific horror reader, people don't know who this is. Mm -hmm. And I can't change 
those guys world there's no chance of that but in whatever way you can play a part to make sure that those working today uh, stay vital to a community that can support them we need to do it now because tomorrow's too late so uh, it's one of those things if you have a friend who reads and who hasn't ever read any elizabeth massey you need to help change that uh, Mm-hmm. If a Lisa Tuttle novel is in your collection and you know someone who would absolutely adore it, mm-hmm. you know what you need to do. Um, I'm really kind of an oddball in that when I buy a book, most times it gets passed on to someone else at some point. I'm not a book hoarder. And I know I know a lot of people will look at that and me, how can you how can you give away the treasure? But my thing is it's only a treasure if it's being enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And if it's sitting on my bookshelf and hasn't been enjoyed, there's something wrong. There's nothing more beautiful than a really beaten up paperback book. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> that pristine limited edition collection collectible version means nothing compared to that copy that's been through 30 hands and been out in the rain once. The spine is broken in seven <laughs> places. Maybe there's a page that's not really connected anymore. <laughs> that's the best possible edition of that book. That's <laughs> how I see it. Yeah, there, there's... That brings back a memory. I would I would love to have seen the copy, but it, it uh, yeah, there was a guy um, Adele James who was um, did a did a bit with Adela uh, was a, a shorter term Adela Biss alumni, but he was uh, part of the Guns and Roses camp, and mm-hmm. he told me that my first Adela Biss book, uh, Nightlife, was a big hit with the L.A. metal crowd. Um, that ended up getting passed around. I really wanted to see that copy. <laughs> I really wanted to smell that copy. <laughs> it might not have been legal to own that. Yeah. <laughs> it could have been sticky. <laughs> yeah. it, it might be in a court sealed document. <laughs> Guys, I, I want to thank all of you for coming on and talking to me today and having this conversation amongst ourselves, because I think this is important. I think that um, while we're able to actually have these conversations, we need to have them, and I think people need to hear it. Um, I think all of you are incredible creators. Um, I'm humbled to be around you. Um, uh, a number of you know like how much you've meant to me on the journey I've had, not even as a writer, as a human being. Because I can remember reading, uh, you know, again, paperbacks or trade paperbacks while waiting in the DMV line for for hours waiting for, you know, my name to be called. You can't believe what that means to people. You can't believe what it means to me. So to have you on my channel means everything to me. I love all you guys. Aww. We love you too. (laughs) Oh, I appreciate that. This has been the most upbeat horror panel I've ever been on. Never. Joy, <laughs> love, healthcare, jeez. <laughs> I, I wouldn't just argue with the description of me as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> Does uh, everyone want to just quickly go around and uh, pimp something of yours? Because, like we said, everything should get supported at some point. Okay, I'll go. Uh, first, first novel of a trilogy. Uh, the novel is called *The Searching Dead*, and it's my my my, my latest, possibly not last, attempt at cosmic horror. And set in fifties Liverpool, the other two volumes will come into the through the eighties into the present day. Uh, not quite the present day as we know it right now, because it was written before the, the pandemic. But um, well, you know, folks seem to like it, and uh, I hope more will. Mike? My, my oh, let me go next. I, I think if I follow Ramsey, it's perfect segue because I'm actually submitting this week uh, some literary criticism about our own Ramsey Campbell <laughs> as part of an ongoing series of books, the Exploring Dark Short Fiction series. Oh. Ramsey, you're up next, and I'm the academic writer for this series, so I'm actually working on some essays about your work. <laughs> You poor guy, you poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> that should be out, I don't know, in two months or, or less, I would imagine. Uh, I'm also working on a novel. I can't really say much about it because I don't like popping the balloon while it's still inflating. Yeah, no, 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 no. Mark, what's up? 
Uh, my new novel, 2B, the number two, the letter B is out. It's a haunted apartment novel. I'm very proud of it. Very gratified with the response it's been getting so far. Awesome. Ooh. Mary. I, I just have to say, like, I feel like I'm in the center of the horror Hollywood squares. The way we're all set up. It's kind of... <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have the middle square. <laughs> um, anyway, I recently. Uh, oh, Alice I, from the Brady Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a, a novella that is coming out in like, I think, like two or three weeks from Thunderstorm Books called The Shapes of Night. It's a cosmic horror novella. Uh, I have another novella. I, I don't know when that's going to be, but um, it's my first post apocalyptic novella uh, called The Skin We're In. Uh, I just finished a cosmic horror haunted house novel, which I'm really excited about. Uh, I don't have any news about when that's coming out yet. And uh, that's basically it. And then I have a, a podcast called Cosmic Shenanigans, where I look at cosmic horror in uh, you know books, movies, television, video games, and talk about you know all of its cosmic horror -y goodness. Awesome. Again? Okay. Um, not a whole lot to uh, pimp out, so I'll just kind of uh, do what, what I do have out there. Um, my first collection, Glass Slipper Dreams Shattered, which came out uh, about three and a half years ago. Um, it's a bunch of uh, drabbles, microfiction, couple short stories. Um, then I have watched the whole goddamn thing burn, which is a... Um, charitable chat book from Nightscape Press. There are, last I checked, 23 copies left. 10% uh, of the, no, I'm sorry, uh, a third of the proceeds, uh, once the copies sell out, will go to Trans Lifeline. And I may, and I'm gonna, and I'm considering putting the remaining share of, uh, my share of it to um, an uh, anti, or um, like a, a stop Asian hate group. Um, this is this one's kind of close to my heart. It's about um, a half Thai girl uh, like myself who um, uh, commits some arson, and uh, which I have not done, um, and the fallout of that. Um, and then the what else? Lastly, um, oh, so lastly, uh, Ed Kurtz and I wrote uh, a story called Son of Man which will be in a Bleeding Edges anthology this summer, which is called The Bad Book. And it's a bunch of uh, bad takes on Bible stories. And <laughs> it's going to be fun. That sounds amazing. Brian. Well, I'm only now just uh, emerging from, a, from about a three-year hiatus here um, that started when, with, with, with some family deaths. Um, and kind of losing losing my life to that uh that became my life for a, for a time so um but i did just uh here in the last few weeks sign a um sign a contract for for my sixth story collection uh black hole sundown so uh that's with cemetery dance so who knows when that's going to be out um <laughs> there may or may not be a uh, a uh, a, a TV series to report on in the, at, at some point in the future. So we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. So, um, but I'm really, I'm only now just kind of, you know, I had a lot of stuff in the pipeline and then the pipeline emptied. So that's, that's what, that's kind of where I am now. Nice. Um, I finished a novel, but my publisher went out of business. So that's, that's lots of fun. Oh. So I'm oh, shopping. No. So we don't know exactly when that's going to happen, um, when it will happen. I have queries out to agents and to publishers. We'll find out what, what's going on there. But in the meantime, you can always reach back to Bleak December, uh, which is uh, the last novel that was published. And uh, you continue to watch this show where I have a bunch of exciting guests coming up, um, including Cullen Bunn, the creator of The Empty Man. Um, I don't know exactly when this video is going up, so... It might be in the rearview mirror, actually, instead of the windshield. I'm not sure. But uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. I want to thank this incredible panel. And uh, everyone out there, stay safe.
Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. Yes. Goodbye. Goodbye.